As MC, I get the privilege and honor of introducing the next speaker, and conveniently enough, that speaker is me. So what I would like to do, I want to actually kind of uh, riff on, on what Steve talked about, because he raised some, some excellent points, and even though we do you know, plan uh, these agendas ahead of time, uh, it doesn't always work out to the point where there's just obvious, clear consistency between the various presentations. But in this case, there absolutely is. You know, he mentioned two key points that I want to expand on. One is the, the clear uh, reality that cloud is really an extension of existing IT operations. And fundamental to cloud enablement is virtualization. It's core to the basic value proposition. But also the notion of thinking about cloud from the, the inside out perspective. I think that's extremely valuable because we tend to uh, far too easily uh, and quickly think of cloud as something external to the organization. That's changing, but that's not the reality. The reality is cloud is lots of different things. Uh, and we need to be aware of all the different permutations of it and more to the point, which of those approaches, uh, permutations, actually provide the most value to us today in six months and 12 months. So I was thinking about the title for this presentation and this kind of struck me as the most kind of apropos for, uh, for today and for the theme for today's event. Yes, there's a lot of fear around cloud still and a lot of it is, uh, and I'll talk about this a bit, a lot of it's certainly reasonable and uh, expected but bordering on irrational. And again, I'll touch on this a bit and I think the panelists will touch on this a bit more. Steve mentioned it as well. Uh, there's certainly uncertainty. This is still a very immature, rapidly evolving market. So uncertainty is normal to be expected. But, and here's the, the key, there's adoption. There is no doubt that cloud is being adopted. It will continue to be adopted. All of you, all of your organizations are adopting cloud, whether you want them to, whether you're aware that they are. Cloud is being adopted. Cloud services are being consumed and that will continue to grow. So understanding how best to manage, control and leverage that adoption is really the key challenge for us. So just briefly, I, I use this slide quite a bit because I find it's really valuable just to set the stage around where cloud fits because it's part of a broader context. And uh, you know, one of the, the nice things about being an industry analyst is you know, we go through these phases. You know, every five, seven years, we seem to, to change. We go through periods of massive innovation, followed by periods of, um, uh, let's call it digestion, for lack of a better word, where we try and consolidate everything that we've invested in. We're now clearly moving into a period of massive innovation. And Steve mentioned some of those, as did Dave. You know, there's the sexy high profile areas like mobility consumerization, uh, social computing. But there's also those less uh, sexy, less glamorous, internally focused innovation areas like virtualization, like the ongoing commoditization and standardization uh, of hardware and servers. And underlying all of this, everything we're talking about is basic connectivity, broadband access. These are all critical and they're, they're not mutually dependent, but they are mutually supportive. They drive each other and they fuel each other. And, and we'll hear more about this um, after my presentation from Dave. Second key point is that the innovation is moving. You know, organizations are not focused on improving back office processes. Leading organizations have done that. And that is now a continuous process that they do. But the real innovation is happening at the edges as we say. So where Steve talked about big data, for instance, as a perfect example, all that really means is leveraging information generated by many of these innovations like mobility, like consumerization, with the understanding and the acceptance that that data currently and will forever reside outside the organization. But you still need to leverage it for innovation, for competitive differentiation. We need to better understand our customers, for instance, so we need to know uh, what they're saying on social networking sites, as an example. 
third key point is how these trends are impacting decision making within the organization. Certainly there's the demographic shifts that we're all very familiar with in terms of, of usage of technology, but also not even among demographics. I'm just talking about the change in who is influencing IT decisions. And I'm talking about the business now and their ability to source the services they need, either from IT, optimally from IT, or elsewhere. If IT cannot provide what's required, they will source that. That's having a significant uh, impact on the organization, on who controls the decision making, who has the power, the influence within the organization. And finally, it's basic economics. You know, if you want to understand any IT market, understand the economics, and cloud is no different. It's all about uh, pay as you go, an ad as a service model. One of the good things about the cloud market, the cloud industry, from an economic standpoint, is it's, there's improved uh, transparency. With transparency, particularly in the economics of how we pay for services, with transparency comes improved efficiency, improved uh, competitive landscape, which helps us as consumers because it actually drives a more uh, efficient market. So from a CIO perspective, what are we talking about? Well, there's kind of two realities. One, it's the business use of technology is continuously increasing. And two, user expectations around technology are increasing. Now, look, this isn't new. I, I know this isn't new. Go back over the past 40, 50 years. Use of IT within the business has continually grown. Expectations for users has continually grown. What's new is an acceleration in the rate of change. It's increased dramatically, and it will continue to increase dramatically. And the reality that we all you know, live and breathe from the IT standpoint is that IT budgets don't change anywhere near as quickly. And they're not going to. It's just the way it is. So how do we deal with this? Because the current approach to provisioning services and supporting our users isn't enough. As these changes accelerate, and they will continue to, we need new approaches. So cloud is not the answer, it's part of the answer. It's one of the approaches that organizations are using to help uh, overcome or at least begin to meet some of these challenges they're seeing. So here are some adoption numbers, and I've circled uh, Australia here. So Forrester Research, what we do Annually, uh, we survey organizations, a combination of IT and business decision makers across the region. And in this case, it's, it's over 500 organizations that we speak to, uh, to understand their adoption trends, their concerns, their initiatives, their priorities around cloud. And in this case, uh, you can see the results there for Australia. So currently, and we, we completed this uh, in late Q3, of last year. So approximately 62% of organizations in Australia are either currently leverage, leveraging or actively planning to leverage cloud. Now, Australia has for the last three years been about 10 points higher than the regional average. So 12 months ago, it stood at about 52%, about half of organizations. 12 months before that, it was around 35%. So it's continuing to, continuing to grow and it will continue to grow. What I thought was even more interesting, though, was, was this slide. And these results are specifically for Australia. See the top number there. 74% of Australian organizations are seeking approaches to centralized procurement uh, and management of services through IT. That doesn't mean they're there yet. That's the objective. But at the same time, you see at the bottom, a third of organizations still have no formal strategy for cloud. Now, Cloud is not one thing. We, we know this, but unfortunately, the only way to graphically represent it is with a really messy slide. Uh, so that's what this is. This is Forrester's cloud taxonomy. This is an overview of cloud-based services. And the easiest way to understand this taxonomy is based on the axes. So the vertical axis from private cloud through to public cloud, it's all based on the level of sharing. Private cloud at the bottom, that's your data center. 
You may share across divisions or units within the company, but it's your data center. Virtual private cloud is hosted off-site, but the level of sharing is still controlled, still limited, still defined. And the top is public cloud, where the infrastructure is off-site and uh, you share that data center or those data center resources with many, uh, many customers. The key difference between public cloud and virtual private is two, only two differences. One, as a consumer, you know where the data center is, you know where and how your data is stored, and two, you have some control over how you access that data, how you access the service, either through a dedicated line or through a virtual private network. Whereas a public cloud, um, you have no control, ultimately, over where the data is stored, no real control over how you access those services. And I think that's interesting, particularly in Australia, because if we look at the numbers overall, there's a heavy focus, and Steve even mentioned it, on infrastructure as a service. AWS has done a fantastic job of building a presence, building demand for infrastructure as a service. Uh, but what we're seeing and what we expect over the next two to three years is far stronger growth around dynamic infrastructure services, which is simply infrastructure as a service over a virtual private cloud. And the reason is very simple. People want more control. They will still access infrastructure as a service when and where they need it opportunistically. That market will continue to grow, but we're going to see far stronger demand for more controlled access to services and far greater demand for dynamic infrastructure services as a market. Another key point, just for perspective, it's, it's, it's always critical, I think, to, to, to make this point. This is a global cloud market size. You can see the total global cloud market, based on Forrester's estimates, is approximately 41 billion US for 2011. Of that, 21 billion, little more than half, is software as a service. It still dominates this market, despite um, all of these different categories, many of which are really just beginning to emerge, in some cases really haven't fully emerged yet and will evolve pretty rapidly. SaaS is still by far uh, the major market in this space. So that explains why when people think about cloud, talk about cloud, we tend to think of it as something external. Because in terms of spending, that's where the majority currently is. But that's not where it's going to remain. And this is the critical point. This is where the link to internal IT operations come because much of the growth is going to come from your own organizations. But I always want to make this connection because this is critical. It's not about cloud as something distinct, as this initiative that is monolithic. Yes, it's a collection of different categories, different sub-segments, but it's more than that. It's actually more linked to IT operations than most of us really consider. Just think about the fundamental characteristics of cloud, the, 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 the basic uh, criteria that define cloud. It needs to provide for economies of scale, and it needs to provide for dynamic resource allocation, and it needs to provide for self-service pay-as-you-go model. Well, compare those characteristics, those criteria, to your own organization. And you can see exactly where the focus needs to be. If you have any interest in moving towards becoming a cloud provider, or more to the point, let me say it differently, have any interest in adopting some of those characteristics or criteria of cloud, which are inherent goodness. It's a good thing to improve our resource allocation. I'm sure we'd all agree with that. It's a good thing to improve efficiency in our data center. It's a good thing to be able to allocate those resources more effectively and to both provision and deprovision those services. And it's a good thing to allow people to pay for what they consume when they consume it. Well, there are some significant implications for internal IT in order to move towards enabling those characteristics. It starts with infrastructure virtualization. Internally, you really cannot 
uh, adopt those characteristics, optimize those characteristics without virtualization as a starting point. It's critical to improving resource allocation, particularly among the servers. And equally important, we don't have unlimited resources. It's time, skills, money, so we need to rationalize, always need to rationalize what services we will deploy, what applications we have that can be uh, transformed into services that can be delivered over this infrastructure. We need to prioritize. The only way to prioritize is to understand our portfolio of applications and the services uh, that, that make up those applications. Another key point to cloud enablement, or cloud, let's say, characteristic enablement, for lack of a better word, is standardization and automation. Standardizing how you expose these services, how you deliver these services, and doing as much as possible to automate that delivery. The next area uh, that actually doesn't get nearly as much focus as it needs to is around usage monitoring and chargeback. This is critically important, and it's something that IT has traditionally been terrible at, how to manage chargebacks, how to manage usage monitoring. For many organizations, many groups within the organization, there's resistance to that. They don't want that level of transparency in the organization. So there's, there's definite resistance from the organizational standpoint. And there's also issues with licensing arrangements. Vendors will need to modify their approach to licensing if we are to enable and support a pay-as-you-go type model, because that's not the way the industry is currently set up, at least the traditional on-premise industry. And you see the other areas there, security and access, which is really the focus for today, uh, and self-service portals, some approach, uh, app store-like, if you will, for people to source what they need when they need it. Uh, but here's, here's the real key. You know, the real point to all of this is not that we as IT need to change. You know, I could say that at any point over the last 30, 40 years. We've always needed to change, needed to improve, needed to innovate. What's new now is that if we don't, someone else will do it for us. Internal IT has competition. Cloud providers and even traditional hosting service providers and other folks who have been in this space for a long time who are now embracing cloud approaches, they are legitimate competition to us. And the reason they're more competition now than they were 5, 10, 20 years ago is because of those characteristics of cloud. The economies of scale are improving dramatically. The ability to provision and deprovision in a timely fashion are improving dramatically. As these improve, the resistance to leveraging an external provider drops steadily. Drop to the point that IT at some point gets cut out of the decision. It becomes a decision that the CFO makes at some point. It's not a decision that IT makes. If IT doesn't adapt and adopt these approaches, we will find the business simply going around us. They will find a way to get the services they need. So I wanted to bring this point up, and this was really where I suppose the fear and uncertainty in the present presentation come up, which is around the real, the, the real barriers, the concerns related to cloud. And they're certainly legitimate. The two top ones, uh, every study I've seen has these two listed in, in some order. These are results specifically for Australia. It's data privacy, residency, or um, perceived loss of control. And that's in quotes because that's more of a perception uh, for folks. That's number one. And security is, let's call it 1A. Those are the top two issues. And again, they're legitimate. But here's the point I wanted to raise. Now, this is, this is very timely. Uh, any art lovers in the audience, this is, I guess, an IT riff on uh, The Scream, a uh, famous uh, painting by uh, Edward Monk, I think it's pronounced Monk. Any Norwegians here? I think it's pronounced Monk. Anyway, he, he painted four of these, uh, these paintings about 100 years ago. One of them is up for, uh, for auction. I think it's actually this Thursday, May 2nd, in London. It's expected to fetch around $80 million US. Uh, so I believe we're all in the wrong industry. Uh, but anyway, that aside, I like this picture because when you talk about cloud, you talk about public cloud, 
particularly in Australia. This is the, the reaction, either maybe not physical, it's not like Macaulay Culkin in uh, Home Alone. Uh, it's, it's more, I think, what you see in people's eyes is this fear. But what I'd argue is beware red herrings, and what I mean by that specifically, look, the USA Patriot Act is an issue. It's a consideration. It is not the consideration. There is a concern about the US Patriot Act, in my view, that completely uh, transcends the reality. The fact is, as organizations, if we do business in the US, or a subsidiary does business in the US, and the US wants access to our data, they would likely have been able to get it before the US Patriot Act. And they can likely still get it now, whether the data that we have resides in the US or not. There are enough bilateral, bilateral agreements between the US and Australia that if the US really wants data for a particular purpose, they can probably get it. Again, the key here is not that it's not valid. It's just that it cannot be the excuse we use for not doing cloud. It's not going to work. It's a short-term excuse, and that's really all it is, is an excuse. Um, it's, you know, it's related to, I call it FUD. You, know, you, you all know the acronym, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It sells. There are folks with a vested interest in creating and maintaining this concern. Uh, and also, more than anything, it's driven by a lack of understanding, lack of awareness. So luckily, I think on the panel, I believe we have uh, an attorney is actually one of the panelists after the break. So hopefully we'll touch on this point because I think it is critical to understand this and more to the point to just create a bit more awareness and understanding about the actual implications and the perceived implications because I think there's a big gap between the two. But short term, the result, absolutely, we're seeing investments in local data centers as a result of this concern. That's not a bad thing. But what I would argue is if you look at the basic economics of cloud, you look at the basic principles of cloud, ultimately, longer term, you start looking out three to five years, the benefits of taking advantage of those economies of scale is going to drive people towards using public cloud services. We may absolutely leverage lots of virtual private cloud-based services, but we will also absolutely leverage more public cloud-based services because the, the financial benefits and the productivity benefits and the, 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 the time to market benefits that we'll have and that will be provided by global players, some of whom will not have data centers here in Australia, will simply be too compelling to ignore. So Steve touched on this. I'm not sure if, I think he said there were three, three steps. Um, slightly different steps, but, uh, but basically it's the same exact message, which is very good to see. In terms of your internal cloud strategy, so I'm not talking about leveraging software as a service or infrastructure service, but how to begin to embrace some of those cloud characteristics that I mentioned, what we're seeing is basically a kind of a three-level uh, approach, three-stage approach to adoption. It starts with data center refresh, moves towards renovation, and ultimately to transformation. So what we're talking about here, very basic, uh, and I don't want to spend too much time on it because I think you'll hear more about this throughout the day. In terms of refresh, it's server refreshes. It's leveraging some of the advantages of server virtualization in particular, or expanding your server virtualization far more broadly within the enterprise. And as far as the key performance indicators, it's all about uh, IT service levels still. It's an IT-centric measurement of value. We move to data center renovation. We're talking about expanding virtualization beyond servers to things like storage, uh, networking, applications. And, and we're talking very much about uh, um, the platform and the management platform, many of the things that actually Steve talked about for uh, your various virtual machines. And the KPIs move more towards um, from service, IT service specifically, to the, uh, the link between IT service and actual value metrics. And then longer term, it's about data center transformation. And really, you know, the one word I would use to describe this is automation. It's where we have the ability to not only manage this infrastructure, but to automate 
the management, automate the provisioning, automate, automate the deprovisioning of those services. And that's where the KPI becomes a pure value metric. That's where IT is a service provider to the business and is measured as a service provider. Now again, for perspective, let's be clear on this because this is a journey. Our estimate at Forrester, roughly 80%, probably a bit more than 80% of organizations are still focused squarely on data center refreshes. So if this is where you are, and odds are this is where you are, and still embracing virtualization, that doesn't mean you're behind. By definition, we're talking an excess of 80%, cent, 80 this is roughly where you should be. This is the state of the market in terms of adopting this as the foundation for some broader characteristics of cloud. Roughly 15% of organizations are expanding their virtualization, let's say, let's say dramatically, in the areas of um, storage and of applications. Uh, and then the final roughly 5% of organizations, we'd estimate, are doing full data center transformation. And oh, by the way, most of these are service providers. And there's a very good reason for that. This is their core business. They have to enable these capabilities. They have to improve their ability to automate these core functions or they will cease to exist. It's as simple as that. Someone else will do this better and will take, take their lunch, essentially. So what does that mean in kind of technology terms? Well, again, if we map the approach to it, I talked early on about one of the key trends. It's about hardware commoditization, server uh, commoditization, x86 as one of the foundations for driving this evolution. From there, clearly it moves towards expanding that virtualization uh, and the ability to manage these VMs, which is far from easy. This is a major challenge, and this is the reason most organizations, 80% or more, are still focused on server virtualization because leveraging virtualization, embracing virtualization within your entire data center is hard. It's not easy to manage lots of VMs, and lots is my technical term for it. It could be a huge number of VMs. And then finally, uh, virtual data center. You know, it's interesting when we talk about this. I was at a, um, it was a financial services event. This was up in Singapore maybe about six weeks ago. And, um, and it was funny, I, was, I was, did a panel. I moderated the panel. There were four CIOs from major banks, regional banks uh, on the panel, and none of them would utter the C word. None of them would mention cloud. It just kind of refused. It just wasn't part of their vocabulary. But all four of them, when I pressed them for kind of what their critical priorities, either top one or top two, was enabling a virtual data center. They were focused on things like disaster recovery, like flexibility to, to manage growth, and they wanted to have a virtual data center, which they defined very much as location independent, as automated, as in every conceivable way meeting the characteristics of a cloud, but not calling it a cloud. And that's fine. It makes absolutely no difference to me. I'm not religious about the topic. Call it whatever you want. The point is these characteristics are inherently good, and they're things that we need to embrace. And it's happening everywhere, even in markets, like in this case, um, banking, which is what the sector was, where no one's talking about cloud, or at least the four CIOs on this panel weren't talking about cloud. But they were all doing it. We are just calling it something else. It's fine by me. So let me leave you with these points. And again, I think we'll hear some of the other speakers will, will uh, touch on these a bit more, and, and certainly we'll have time during the Q&A, I think, to drill down a bit. But a few key points. First, don't think you can ignore cloud. Don't think you can simply say no, uh, either now or in six months or in 12 months, and that's the end of it. It is happening. It will happen either with your support and control, hopefully, or without it. Uh, but it's going to happen. It's already happening in just about every organization. And part of that, part of the acceptance of that reality is understanding our role. As CIOs, as IT professionals, it's not about technology. It's never been about technology. Our role, our responsibility is to provision services to the business. The services the business needs to 
run the business. That's it. How we provision those services, well, that should be up to us. That's where the control needs to come in. We need to have some say over how we do that. But ultimately, provisioning of the services is what we do. Managing technology is just a means to that end. Um, the third point, again, uh, you know, I think of this market like every other from an economics background. Expect some of that transparency to continue and to drive improvements in the market in terms of market efficiencies, in terms of um, um, uh, price points for you and you're leveraging negotiation ability, but also competition in the market. Uh, expect to see more competition driven by some of that transparency, which is, is a beautiful thing. And, and the final point, think about those overall economics as they impact your organization. So pay as you go and embracing that as much as possible, um, understanding the constraints within your organization, understanding that there will be resistance to some of those approaches, but understanding as well that the only way for IT to truly become an effective service provider is to provide some of those benefits of transparency and efficiency uh, to the organizations that we support. So with that, I will um, thank you very much for your time.